hey guys, real quick, I want to say on behalf of, of uh, the, the Scott family and, and the Hagen family, thank you so very, very much for everybody that, that just began to pour into uh, to that family. As you know, Uncle Seal went to be with the Lord, and uh, everybody stepped up in a huge way. Thank you for pulling the table out from under me. Uh, everybody stepped up in a huge way, and, and I talked to Sister Velma last night, and she said, I cannot thank you enough. The entire church family stepped up, and she goes, and, and we uh, were so full because of all the food and, and, and just the words of encouragement and, and the love that everybody showed. She said, I want to say thank you and Restore Church for showing the love that you've had for us and our family. So, guys, I want to say thank you for, for stepping up and doing what we do very, very well. Amen. Look. Uh, look, we, we might not do a lot of things well, but we do that in excellence. Can you see? Amen. We believe in taking care of our own. Yes. Amen. Yes. So, yes. guys, one more time, thank you very, very much for doing that. Yeah, and we joke that we, we do well eat around here. We eat well around here, but we, we fellowship, we care for people, we love on people well. And um, pastors always said, man, if I could just preach and love on people, like, that's what I do well. And, um, That'd and be a perfect job, amen. Yes, and <laughs> and that's what Pastor does really, really well. Um, and uh, and um, and we did serve that family very, very well. And um, and Uncle Sill's presence here is going to be absolutely missed. But there are so many, so many that were touched by him, and uh, continue to be uh, touched by him and his family. And we're so thankful that God brought them here. And uh, the rest of the family will remain here, and we're so thankful for that. I know that they are exhausted yeah. and um, that they're probably home watching this morning. I know Rob's here, but um, that the, the, the rest of the family I know is home resting, and, um, and well, they should be. Yeah. So we're going, to, we're going to launch into this message today. Um, and if you're a visitor in the house, thank you for being with us. Yeah. And um, yeah. you're a guest, you, but, you, but you came into our home. And so you come in as a guest or a visitor, but once you're in our home, you're family. Right. And so please make yourself at home. And uh, we're going to bring a message today. If you've never seen uh, a team before, um, this is the head of the church, but thankfully he allows me to, um, to sit next to him and carry the word. Um, we're going to talk today about obedience brings blessing. And uh, we're going to start in... Um, in uh, in Deuteronomy 28, and um, and I'm going to find that clicker. And Pastor, you go ahead and, um, and and figure out where we're going this morning. I'm sorry, I have my clicker with me. It's probably in my purse. I threw it up there. And uh, we're going to go to Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 6. Because this is the words of Moses, and and we're going to put this on the screen in, in just a second. But let me go ahead and, and begin to read this. The Bible says, there we go, in Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 6, the Bible says, if... Come on, that, that's a small word but such a large meaning. Can you say amen? If, watch this, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all of his commands that I am giving you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the world. You will experience all these things if you obey the Lord your God. He went on to say your towns and fields will be blessed. Your children and crops will be blessed. The offspring of your herds and flocks will be blessed. Your fruit baskets and breadboards will be blessed. Wherever you go and whatever you do will be blessed. Can you say amen? Now guys, let, let me share this with you this morning. These were actually words spoken by Moses to the children of Israel as a decree from the Lord. See, God was telling them, obey me and be blessed. Blessed beyond belief. Disobey me and you will go from the blessed life to the stressed life. Can you say amen? Your blessings will become a burden. Now, now think about this for just a second. You would think that after hearing how God would richly bless them, and make everything fall into place if they obeyed him. How God promised to open doors for them and bless them with peace, with power, and with prosperity. They would do nothing but obey him. That would be common sense. Can I get a witness? We, we would think that. Can you say amen? Now, see, I, I, I believe that obedience, according to the word, is a no-brainer. 
Come on, now's a good time to say amen. The Bible says just obey and God's blessings will be yours. Pretty easy, right? Not so. Watch this. But when we do a little bit of reading in the Bible, we find out that, that Israel's track record through the Word of God was not that great. As a matter of fact, we know that, that Israel could not obey God for very long without straying off and before long doing their own thing. Go on, shake your head this way. Let me know you're still with me. Amen. Watch this. They would continue to do life their way, which means they would do life the hard way instead of God's way. And instead of experiencing the blessed life, they would continue to live a life full of burdens instead of a life full of blessings. But before you and I get all super spiritual and begin to judge them, come on somebody. We got to realize today and, and, and admit that mankind has always had a struggle with obedience. You know, it, all we got to do is look in the Bible and, and we find out that, that looking all the way back in the beginning, we can start in the book of Genesis and find out that mankind always had an issue with obedience. We find out with the first man in the garden. God said, don't do it. What did Adam do? He did it anyway. God said, live, my, live life my way. And Adam said, I'm going to live life my way. And because of Adam's disobedience, he lived a life of hardship and a life of burdens instead of a life of blessings. Okay, so maybe the question that we um, should be asking is a little bit different. If... if um, if today we have an issue with obedience, if the Israelites had an issue with obedience, if Adam and Eve had an issue with obedience all the way back in the beginning of time, then maybe we should ask a different question today, right? Um, and maybe we should ask, why is obedience a recurring theme in all of our lives, all of their lives, all of our lives? Um, is it recurring as a theme in the Bible as well? And why is it important to God? Why is it so important to God that he would require obedience literally at every turn, right? So obedience is, is obviously something that's really big with God. Why? Um, if we're going to talk about obedience, we need to kind of understand what obedience is about. The Bible speaks a ton about obedience. Um, it's very, very important with God. It's extremely important with us, too, when you think about it. Um, everywhere we go, the theme of obedience is right there. Yeah. The basic definition of obedience is this, comply, to comply with an order, a request, a law, a submission to authority. It basically means this, do what you're told. Yeah. Right, yeah, parents? Right. Come on. Amen. Um, obedience is a, a common expectation no matter where you go, no matter what you're doing. The government right now is expecting a lot of um, obedience and us to comply with their ever-changing rules and regulations from week to week, right? right. Come on, I, I at least give an amen on that one. Yeah. yeah. Um, in the workplace, obedience is expected from employees and staff members. Um, as parents, we expect and we talk a lot about obedience with our children. Come yes. On. I knew I'd get. I knew I'd get Laura's. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, um, we tie obedience even to the love and respect talk don't we? Come on. Yes. Um, because, you know, we sit our children down and listen, if we do this, if you respect us as your parents, if you love us, then you'll obey our rules. Yeah. I thought I'd get an, an, a, an amen from the very back row with our son. Come on. If you, if you respect us, if you love us, then you'll obey our house rules. You'll do what we ask and what we expect of you. So, is that wrong? Is that, is that manipulative? Is that wrong? Hmm. See, sometimes, no, it's not, because here's the thing. Um, we might think that that sounds manipulative, that that sounds wrong, that that sounds like a guilt statement. If you were raised under guilt and condemnation, that may feel wrong to you. But listen, let's think about this. Doesn't your workplace say, listen, if you love your job, then follow my rules. Follow our rules, comply to our orders, um, honor and respect the expectations that are placed on you. And we do, and we have no problem with that. You see, most of us don't, uh, don't have a problem whatsoever obeying and supporting and standing with someone or something 
that we respect, that we agree with, that we appreciate, that we love and value, we don't have a problem with that. Come on. Where we have a problem complying and obeying is when you don't agree with something, right. when you don't support it, when right. you don't feel like there's an appreciation for what's being asked of you. Are you with me? Come on. Come on. Some of you are already going, mm, and that's why I don't, and then you fill in the blank. See, the Bible actually says a similar thing to the whole, if you respect me, if you love me, then obey me, yeah. in John 14, 15. Let's take a look at that. If you love me, then keep my commands. Come on, come on, there it is. If you love me, then keep my commandments. Right, that's two different um, versions, translations right there. But if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commands. In other words, there's no guilt there's no condemnation there. It's simple. If you love me, keep my commands. Here, here's the, the deal behind that one. See, love is the root. Obedience is the fruit. Come on. That's good stuff. See, truly, son, daughter, if you love me, then you're with me. That's right. Then you're supporting what's going on in this house. You're supporting this family. You're with us. You're following us. You're for us, not against us. Right, right. That's right. The obedience yeah, is yeah. the fruit. It's also your car and your phone and your, no, just kidding. <laughs> Love is the root. Obedience is the fruit. Uh, that, that part was manipulation. Just kidding. But love is the root and obedience is the fruit, right? Here's some more verses to show you that when love is the root, obedience will be the fruit. Let's look at 2 John 6. The Bible says, love means doing what God has commanded us. 1 John 5, 2 through 5 says, The test of the genuineness of our love for God and his family lies in this question. Do we obey his commands? Going to get good today. Come on, guys. The Bible goes on to say, For loving God means obeying his commands. For these commands of his are not burdensome to us. Not burdensome to us. In other words, it's not too hard to obey you, God. That's right. It's not too hard to do what you've asked. I love you. I'm with you. Yeah. I'm following you. That's right. So truly, obedience is as much or more than just doing what we're told robotically because you say so. In fact, God just doesn't want a bunch of robots. Come on. He wants the root to be love yeah. so that the fruit truly is obedience. That's right. When we obey, it really is about honoring and respecting and supporting and choosing to follow the lead of the someone or the something that's asking us. Mm -hmm. It really is. And it does show appreciation and it does show agreement I mean because isn't that what we feel as as parents when our kids aren't obeying it's like really isn't that what normally comes right out of our mouth really for all we do for you isn't that normally come what on. we say come on mom and daddy <laughs> yeah. I mean even if you don't have kids if you're an aunt or an uncle or even a friend seriously for all I've done for you, there's an appreciation about doing something that someone's asking of you because it means there's an appreciation, there's an agreement, there's a love, there's a validation for who and what is asking you to come alongside them. So in relation to when God says, I'm asking you to obey, here's what obedience really is about. It's a demonstration of faith in God. That's right. And for those of you over 40, I'm going to read these to you because these are going to be small. I got you, babe. You got a few you're supposed to read. Do you need me to help you out? Let me know. Obedience to God. That's right. It's on your paper. Obedience to God means a demonstration of faith in God. 
It's so funny, some of you go, gosh, do you guys have a lot of notes? No, see, when we started printing notes for ourselves, they used to be printed, uh, I'm telling honest, yeah. They used to be printed in like 15 or 16 point. They're now printed in 20 to 22 point. So now we just have more pages, that's all. That's why we flip more often, yeah. We're getting older. I can see good, it just has to get farther and farther yeah. away from my right. face for, Right. come on guys, you with me, right? Right. <laughs> And pride comes before fall because you won't wear glasses. A demonstration of faith. No, just kidding. Um, a dem neither will I. A demonstration of faith in God. That's what obedience means. That's why it's such a slap in the face when God says, obey me. You see, it's a demonstration of faith in God. God, I have faith in you. I'm going to obey you. Right. I'm going to obey you. It's a giving of respect and honor to God, right? It's like, it's God, I honor you. I respect you. I'm going to obey you. I'm with you. Mm. Obedience to God means... Showing appreciation for God. Come on, how many know he's the author of all things? Yeah. Amen. He's a good, good father. Amen. Now, the next thing, willfully surrendering to God. That's what obedience means. Yeah. God, your way is better than my way. Yeah. Amen. I'd rather live in obedience instead of disobedience. Yeah. Obedience to God means following his lead. Watch this, not our lead. Mm -hmm. Your way will get you in trouble every single time. Amen. Amen. Follow God's lead, not your lead. Finally, watch this. Obedience to God means being in full agreement with him. What does that mean? Being in full agreement, not partial agreement. Let me say it again. I've said it before. If you're not all in, you ain't in at all. Come on, guys. We've got to follow his lead, not our lead. Yep. It means loving and adoring God. God, I'm with you. I adore you. I'm in awe of you. You are bigger than me. You obviously see a bigger picture than I do. I'm with you. That's right. I am absolutely with you, Lord. It means trusting God in all his ways, mm -hmm. whether they're understood completely in this moment or not. Oh, wow. Come on. That's good. Come on. You see, some of us go, I trust you, God. I just need to understand first. No, you don't. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Huh? Nope. How many, I mean, how many times do, are we screaming that as we're, as we're trying to get out of the house? Yeah, but hold on. I, I, I just need to know where we're going. No, you don't. Come on. Let's go. I'll tell you in the car. How many times do we say that? You don't need to know where we're going. Just get dressed. How many times is God yelling that from heaven? You don't need to know. I told you to get dressed. Let's go. And that's the thing. Trusting God in all of his ways, whether we understand where we're going or not, just go. See, perhaps, perhaps that and this right here is why obedience is so huge with God. Because that's what obedience means. That's why when he asks us to obey, that's really what it means. It means being with him. That's it right. means following him. Right. You see, what God is expecting of us is this. Obedience is a wholehearted act of worship and honor to God yeah. when we obey him. Yeah. It's honoring him. It's worshiping him. It's being with him. Holman's um, Illustrated Bible Dictionary uh, records this, and I, I love this. Biblical obedience is to hear God's word and to act accordingly. Wow. Remember, being not just hearers of the word, right, but doers of the word, right, to hear and to do it. Because what's to hear it? If your kid looked at you and said, yeah, I, I heard that you told me to take out the trash, but yet he remained on the couch watching his movie, Oh, I heard you. Oh, that's nice. How many times does God want to say, yeah, 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 but I want you to hear me, but then I want you to act accordingly. Right. See, to hear and to trust and to submit and to surrender to his word and then to act on it. That's what true biblical obedience is. And so oftentimes what we do is we hear it, but then we don't trust him enough to get up off of our tails and to go and do and to surrender and, and to say, God, I don't really have to understand it, but I'm going to follow you anyways because I'm honoring you and I'm worshiping you and I'm surrendering to you and I love you and I'm with you, right? Thank you, Cooney. And Joyce. Amen. That's right. Yes, that's you. No. Look, guys, another, another, another had, had a malfunction. Another Greek word for obey in the New Testament means to trust. Yeah. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, and we can be sure that we know him yeah. if we obey his commands. Mm. 
If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. Wow. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living for him. You know what I love in, the, in this verse right here, and we're supposed to go on, but I, I love this because it says this. It says, we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commands. When you think about this, if we truly know God and we know his character, the more you know someone, truly know him truly know that person and you know their character and you know how faithful they are and how trustworthy they are. The more you know that person, the more you're with that person. The more you can rely on that person and you could just almost blindly go with them. Because you just know their character. And that's why it says you can be sure that you know him if you obey him. Because if we're obeying him, then that means that we truly know that he's faithful and we can be with him. So if we're not obeying him, then we probably don't know him very well to have enough faith in him to just be with him. Did you get that? If I'm not obeying him, it's probably because I don't have enough faith in him to just go with him and... It's probably because I don't know him well enough to just keep by his side and to just know that's the dude I need to stick with right there. That's right. Are you with me? Amen. And don't be offended that I just called him dude because I'm, I'm just, I'm sharing with you like the heart matter yeah. that God's the one I want to stick with. There's no one that I could possibly follow and want to be with. Where else could I go? Who else would I ever follow? Who else could I ever put my trust in? And why would I ever look in the mirror and go, oh, yeah, I can totally do this better than God? Because I am sure to mess it up. Are you with me? He's the one. You see, obedience to God means to prove our love for God. It means to demonstrate our faith in him, and it means to confirm our trust in him. So when we say, I'm following him, it's because we know him so well that we know that he'll never let us down. And when we go with him, it is in turn to him, God, I'm proving my love to you as well. And I'm proving my faith in you and my trust in you. I'm with you. Now, guys, I want you to understand the battle to walk in obedience did not just take place in the Old Testament. All we got to do is go to the New Testament and, and find out that this same battle was all through the 27 books of the New Testament as well. And today for the next uh, session of the sermon, I want to focus on a story found in Luke chapter 5 verses 1 through 11. And I want you to look and, and let's observe how the Apostle Peter obeyed Jesus when things did not make sense. Let's look at these first uh, 11 verses. The Bible says in chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had gone out of them and left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, or Peter, its owner to push it out a little into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, no, Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, We worked hard all last night and did not catch a thing. But if you say so, I will let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. And soon both boats were filled with fish on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, 
he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please forgive me. I'm such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Verse 11 says, Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and they followed Jesus. Guys, for the next couple of minutes, what I want to do is I want to break this story down, and, and I really want to focus on some of these points. And, and first of all, the Bible says in chapter 5 and verse 1, there were large crowds that had gathered to hear Jesus. Why is that? In order for you and I to better understand, we've got to go back to chapter 4. The Bible says that in chapter 4 that, that Jesus walked in Simon Peter's house. There his mother-in-law was burning up with a fever. As Jesus walked in that house, he immediately laid hands on her, and that sickness fled her body. News began to spread like wildfire. Watch this, that Jesus was in the house. Can you say amen? So everybody brought the sick, the blind, the lame, even the demon-possessed. And it was there on Peter's porch where the Son of God stepped off the porch and began to wade through the sea of people, touching, healing every single one of them that day. The Bible says the next day Jesus went inside the synagogue and began to preach with power and with authority. And all of a sudden, in the middle of this message, a demon-possessed man began to speak out. But I love the fact that Jesus was not intimidated. Can I get a witness, somebody? But the Bible says he was infuriated. So he walked up to that man, laid hands on him, rebuked the enemy, and set that man free. Then he turned around and walked outside of the building, leaving everybody in amazement, saying, What kind of man is this? Watch this. He left the synagogue, and then he went down to the seashore. So every single person followed Jesus. That's why the Bible says they were pressing upon him to hear the word of God. Can I tell you today that, that commentaries say they pushed and they shoved. They were jockeying for position, if you will, just to get close enough to Jesus. Some say to the point of possibly pushing him into the water. Now, i got to tell you, I would love the fact that they pushed him in because he wouldn't sink. He would stand on the water. Can you say amen? What, what an amazing story to see Jesus standing on the waves preaching to the people on the seashore. But instead, the Bible says he saw two boats that were pulled to shore. And, and i got to tell you, I actually read a commentary today that the amazing thing is that out of all the boats on the Sea of Galilee, he chose those two boats. Commentaries say there were 4,000 boats on the lake that day. Come on, that's awesome. Can you say amen? But the Bible says he stepped inside of one of the boats that happened to belong to Peter. And he told Peter, push the boat out just a little bit from the shore. It is here. Watch this. Where Jesus used Peter's boat as a podium or a platform or a pulpit to preach to the people on the seashore. Are you with me so far? Then after he was finished preaching the gospel, after he spoke life into a crowd that needed to hear the gospel, he looked at Peter and said, launch out into the deep. Now I want you to keep in mind, the scripture that we just read said that Peter and James and John just fished all night long, Right? The Bible says they were outside of the boats, inside the water. They were washing and they were cleaning their nets. In other words, they were about to hang them up and dry and then go home and catch a little bit of shut-eye. Can you say amen? But all of a sudden, Jesus appears to Peter and gets in Peter's boat, preaches the gospel, and then tells Peter to launch out into the deep and let down his nets for a catch. Now watch this. Here's possibly where the Apostle Peter had a problem. See, you got to realize Peter and some of his apostles or some of the early apostles were commercial fishermen. What does that mean? This is what they did for a living. This was their profession. Come on, they were professional fishermen, right? They, they knew the Sea of Galilee like the back of their hand. Commentaries say these guys grew up on that lake. In other words, nobody knew the lake better than them. 
Look, if, if, if you grew up on a lake, you know where all the right fishing holes are. Can I get a witness, somebody? Man, you know the right bait. You know when the temperature changes. You know when the wind blows. You know everything about that body of water. But watch this. Verse 5. Peter said, Lord, we fished all night, and we didn't get one bite. There is no doubt in my mind, watch this, no doubt in my mind that Peter was probably thinking, are you kidding me? Come on, don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. Lord, Lord, are you kidding me? Are you a carpenter going to tell me, a professional fisherman, how to do my job? Lord, I don't walk into your workshop and tell you how to build something. Come on, guys. So you mean to tell me, you're going to tell me how to do my job? Stay in your lane, Jesus. Come on, guys. I love the fact that when Peter and Jesus were having this conversation, Peter was still rowing his boat out into the deep part of the lake. And watch this. When he got to the perfect location, Jesus told Peter to let down his nets. Listen, I realize Peter knew the lake. Peter grew up on the lake, knew it like the back of his hand, but he didn't know it as good as Jesus did. You realize according to John chapter 1, everything that was made was made by him, and there was nothing made unless it was made by him. So that tells me that Jesus even dug the lake with his hands. If he dug the lake, it meant he put the water in it. Come on, guys. And if he put the water in it, it means he made the fish that were inside the lake. And according to the Bible, if he made the fish, it also means he had dominion over the fish. Come on, don't shout me down. Come on, guys, get what I'm saying. So when Peter let down the net, I'm here today to tell you that every single fish inside the Sea of Galilee tried their best to make their way inside of that net. Can you say amen? Now watch this. Peter's obedience brought big-time blessings. Can you say amen? Now watch this. After fishing all night and not, kidding, not getting a bite at all, the Bible says, because of his obedience, they caught so many fish that he had to call James and John, the sons of thunder, come on, the loud mouths, can you say amen, who were on the other side of the lake to come and help them. And the Bible says this, Peter's nets, had so many fish inside of it that he actually had to get James and John to help him pull the net out of the water. And that one catch had so many fish that the Bible says both of their boats began to sink. What does that tell me? Obedience brings an overflow of blessings every single time. Can you say amen? loves that message, that whole story. There's so much ditty in it. Um, so there's a, a few takeaways that we want to um, just kind of give to you to, to round out this whole message and, and say what, what can we learn from Peter, what can we learn from, um, from obedience, and make sure that we don't miss anything. Um, we need to obey God even and especially in the small things. Mm. You know, it's in the small things that we sometimes um, overlook them and think, oh, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, but we need to obey God even and especially in the small things. Let, let's look at one of the small things that Peter did out of an act of obedience. Remember, the first thing that Peter did was obey Jesus. Very, very subtle, but it, you'll miss this if you're not careful. What's the first thing Jesus said? Thrust out a little from the land. That's the first act of obedience that Peter did. He took his boat and rowed out just a little tiny bit from the shore. But listen, Peter was tired. Come on, he fished all night long. Had no victory. Can I get a witness, somebody? When you fish all night and, and you don't catch anything, you ain't very happy. Come on, guys. Tired, troubled, weary, worn out. This was Peter that day. But watch this. That small act of obedience allowed Jesus, once again, as I said earlier, to use Peter's boat as a pulpit to preach to the people in, uh, on the shore of Galilee. Here's the cool thing. Jesus sat down in that boat and he preached the kingdom of God to all the people on the seashore. Once again, this small act of obedience put Peter in a position to receive an even greater blessing. After Jesus preached to the people, he told Peter to launch out into the deep. But watch this. Peter still had a choice to make. 
Come on, every time we're given a command, how many know we have a choice to make? You've heard it said over and over, you, you make choices or choices make you. Can you say amen? I want you to realize today that Jesus showed up at a point in Peter's life and asked him to do something that was not convenient for Peter to do. So let me ask you a question. How many times has that happened in our lives? When God challenges us or asks us to do something that doesn't make sense. Come on. Give your bracelet to that homeless lady downtown, Cindy, right? Or, or, or how about you buying the person's meal behind you in Chick-fil-A? Come on, guys. The, the, the things that, that seem like they don't make any sense, but when we do those things, God begins to send blessings down that we cannot contain. Can I get a witness, somebody? Watch this. When Jesus told Peter to launch out into the deep, Peter could have replied, Lord, it's too late. I'm already finished. I fished all night long. God, I've already clocked out. I'm heading to the house. Come on, guys. Tonight was a bust. Come on. I didn't catch anything. I'm done. I've already washed and I've cleaned my nets. I'm done for the day. My boat isn't available, Jesus. Why don't you use James and John's boat? See, watch this. If Peter would have said any of those things, he would have missed not only the best fishing trip of his life that he could tell people some crazy stories about. Come on, guys. But he also would have missed seeing Jesus do a miracle that he would never, ever forget. I was just thinking about how little victory he probably had and how Jesus came alongside and said, are you going to allow how you're feeling to, to dictate your obedience to me? How many times does, does God come along and ask us to do something right on the heels of the enemy just tearing us up. totally tearing us up? Yeah. And we expect God to, to ask us to do something when it's convenient for us. Like, God, never. couldn't you have asked us to do something when we were in a better mood? When I was ready. Yeah. It never you know? happens that way, by the way. Yeah. Great moves of God are usually preceded by simple acts of obedience. Sometimes God's greatest blessings come when we are willing to do the smallest of things. Come on. Right? You know, when pastor gives an altar call sometimes, especially, you know, when we're in an auditorium or we're in an auditorium of, of a school auditorium and there's thousands of students, um, and no one's moving. He'll normally say, you know, a, a waterfall begins with one drop of water, you know. And, and it's the, those, those first things that are the biggest things because they're the thing that begins it all. And so sometimes it's just that one and that first thing that begins the greatest thing. That's right. You know, that first person in a crusade that gets up, That's right. that breaks everything. That first person that gets up out of an auditorium of people and says, I'm going to go down to that altar call. Because sometimes people will sit there and sit there and sit there and say, I'll go if somebody else goes. Come on. Right? right? I'll go if somebody else goes. Yes. I'll give if somebody else gives. Yeah. Great moves of God are usually preceded by simple acts of obedience. That's right. And sometimes God uses us to be that simple act of obedience. Amen. Right? Because how many know that everything we own is on loan? Yeah. Come on. Look, Peter's life was changed when he gave Jesus access to his boat. And he rowed it out just a little bit from the shore. Watch this. Peter's journey with Jesus started with a small act of obedience. Number two is um, our obedience not only blesses us, but it blesses others as well. I love this. You cannot obey God without your obedience spilling out into a blessing to all those around you. I love that. Guys, I want you to think about for something for a second. I want you to think about how many people were actually blessed because of Peter's obedience. Hmm. Not only was the crowd blessed because they heard the word of God from the word of God. Amen. Amen. But even Jesus himself benefited from Peter's obedience. Remember... 
He needed a pulpit. And here's the cool thing. Jesus actually got to sit down in the comfort of a boat, according to verse 3, instead of being overcrowded by the crowd of people. That was because of Peter's obedience. Now, once again, more than likely, they were pushing, they were shoving, fighting, if you will, trying to get next to Jesus just so they could hear the words that the Son of God was speaking on the seashore that day. But not to mention Peter, James, and John also received a huge payday. Why? Because according to commentaries, they took all the fish that they had caught from those nets and then got to take it to the marketplace and sold them. And that, by the way, helped finance their mission with Jesus. Come on. Now's a good time to say amen. God often rewards others, in particular those that are closest to us as a result of our obedience. You know, um, I'm thinking about how when a father obeys the Lord, that his entire family reaps the reward or, or, or the blessing of God. That's right. Um, that's why it's so important that daddies come to church. Come on. Amen. That's why it's so important that daddies lead mm-hmm. their families. That's right. You're going to say, well, what if daddy doesn't lead the family and I'm a mama and I'm here and I'm leading? The blessing will still be on that family. That's right. But there's, God is a God of order. Mm-hmm. And God has placed things in order in that way that when that daddy when that daddy steps up it's so important and we see this when we look at um when we look at abraham when we look at um well let's look at genesis um 22 this is just a phenomenal verse um and through your descendants all the nations of the earth will be blessed all because you have obeyed me that's right that's phenomenal yeah because of abraham's obedience that's right and You know, we're talking about obeying God, but let's think about this. And we won't go in this direction very long, but I just feel like I need to mention this. If if the blessing can be upon a family because of the obedience of the head of the family, then so too can a curse be upon a family because of disobedience for generations. And and maybe I'm saying that because some of you are living under some things right now. So I'm just going to follow the leading of the Lord. Some of you are living under things right now that you're trying to get away from and you're trying to figure out what you did wrong. You're trying to escape some some things and it's not what you did wrong. It's what those before you did. Come on. Generational curses. It's called generational curse. And so God wants to encourage you right now that the choices that you are making for right, they matter. Keep making them. That as you're drawing those lines in the sand, as Pastor often says, draw a line in the sand and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. It's those decisions that were made before you. Those were made. But you now draw a line in the sand and say, uh-uh, uh-uh. No, no, as for me and my house, we will now serve the Lord. That's right. That's right. I can't control what they did, and I'm now reaping what they sowed. But from this point forward, I will sow new seeds. That's right. Amen. I will sow new seeds. And I will make sure that my family is blessed and those after me will be blessed because of the choices that I will make. Amen? You change your family tree. And you're going to say, but it's not fair. You're right. It's not fair. But God's favor will be upon you. Come on will be upon you yeah, yeah. and the blessings will begin to flow and That's you right. may have to you may have to kick against some things but you're making that difference and so I just want I just want you to know the frustration that you're up against and every day that you're kicking against it and you want to oftentimes give up don't give up because it makes all the difference and you're going what am I doing wrong nothing those seeds were sown before you mm-hmm. and you're you're doing right I know that it's frustrating and you want to pull out your hair and you want to go but, 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 what am I doing wrong? No, no, God says keep going. That's right. Keep going. You're fighting against things that were sown before you, but you keep going. I'm thinking of some people right here and now. Come on. There's some things that were sown before you, but God says you're, you're changing your family tree. That's right. Amen? Amen? So you draw a line in the sand because the Bible says because of you, because you've obeyed, 
that your descendants will be blessed. So you keep on going that's and right. do not be frustrated and do not give up. God is with you. Amen. I don't know who amen. that's for. Um, amen. Don't receive it. Um, when we obey God, we will never, ever be disappointed. When we obey God, we will never be disappointed. Guys, can I tell you today, I, I believe with everything within me that when, when Jesus showed up, Peter probably thought that his instructions at that moment were a waste of time. Why? Because Peter thought he knew better than anybody else. Have you been there, anybody? Come on, I'm an expert. I'm a master at what I do. I don't need anybody's help. I don't need anybody to tell me what to do, right? But watch this. But when he obeyed the smallest of requests, that is when Peter received the biggest of blessings. Guys, listen, this, this is good. Peter, don't miss this, Peter sowed his ship as a seed into the Savior's ministry. Watch this. Guys, you've heard me say it over and over and over. We cannot outgive God. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Listen, God took Peter's seed, which was his ship, right? He used this seed. Then he multiplied the seed. Then he gave the seed back to Peter. Are you following me so far? Listen, if you believe it or not, Jesus was in need that day. Oh, I don't believe that Jesus had a need. Sure he did. He was totally God, but totally man. Come on. Two individuals united in one personality. The God side of him had no need, but the man side of him had every need. When he was hungry, he had a need for food. Come on, guys. Thirsty, had a need for something to drink. On this day, Jesus needed a pulpit. Are you following me? So here's what happened. Peter sowed his, his seed into the ministry of Jesus, right? Because Peter had a need. And how many know that when you're in need, you need to sow a seed? Peter had a need too. Absolutely. Watch this. Peter had a need, a big time need, because he needed fish. Come on, guys. He was a commercial fisherman. He had a need for fish not only to feed his family, but he also had a need to sell fish in the marketplace to pay his bills. Come on, guys. And have enough money to live on. Are you following me so far? But after Jesus preached in Peter's boat, he blessed Peter's boat. Then he used it as a vehicle to meet Peter's greatest need. Watch this. Jesus turned two empty boats into two full boats overflowing with fish. Guys, can I tell you today, they went from broke to blessed, from overtired to overjoyed overnight. Can I get a witness, somebody? Watch this. This one act of obedience started Peter, James, and John on a journey with Jesus but allow them to walk with him, talk with him, spend time with him for three and a half years, witnessing firsthand every single miracle that the Son of God performed. Obedience means obeying God, watch this, if we feel like it and if we don't. If it's convenient or not. If it fits into our schedules or not. Come on, guys, how many of you know that we can't rely on our feelings? You've heard Pastor Jennifer say, Feelings are fickle, right? And, and feelings are funny. Listen, don't let your funny feelings dictate or determine what you do or don't do. Shake your head this way. Let me Come on. You're awful quiet this morning. You ain't shouting nearly as loud as we're preaching today, guys. Come on. Listen, imagine today what would have happened if Peter would have missed this opportunity by being disobedient. He would have not only missed out on the miracle... But he would have missed out on a huge amount of money that would later help fund their ministry. Listen, guys, because obedience brings blessing, they all experienced mighty ministries. They were all powerful apostles who shook up the ancient world by preaching and promoting the power of the gospel. So let me ask you a question this morning. What small things, what menial things, has the Lord been asking you to do that you have been putting off because we're either too tired, too busy, or because it does not make sense at the moment? They feel like they're menial. They're not menial to God, right? If he asks us to do them, then there's a purpose behind them. They're not menial at all. They just feel like they are. It's a lie from the enemy That's right. to cause us to not do them. 
have we been um, disobedient? Because you see, um, there's 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 two places where we could sit today as we wrap this up. There's just not being obedient, and then there's blatantly being disobedient. There's I'm not following God, and I'm, I'm just not doing what he's saying, and I'm just not obeying the voice of God, or, oh, I heard him. I just ain't doing it. Come on. And so have we been disobedient because he's asked us to do something, and it's clearly just not convenient, convenient for us, or it's not lined up with our schedules, or... Maybe we've neglected some small things. We've not been obedient to some small things. And God's telling us today, don't neglect the small things because they always lead to bigger things. And they're not menial and they're so important to God because we don't know where it leads or we don't know what it is. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking of, of the fact that as we sat around last week with... Um, with Uncle Sil's family. And we were thinking about how we even met that family and how they even ended up here at our church um, was the first time that we put together Financial Peace, yeah. Financial Peace <laughs> University here <clears throat> at Restore. And um, we didn't know what we were doing. Um, and the only way we pushed through it is because Andy finally got out of teaching math after like 16 years or something um, on uh, virtual <coughs> school and got tired of that and, and went into uh, to teach something different. And the something different ended up being Dave Ramsey's course, Financial Peace, it, like in the school system. How random is that, <coughs> that they would make that a, a, a uh, class in the school system? And so because he was teaching it to students, we're like, hey, you can teach it here. And, um, and so while he was also learning it for school, he was learning it here. And so we, we did that, and we did it after church on a Sunday. And um, there was no nursery worker, so I was the nursery worker. After preaching on Sundays, I would go back there and work the nursery for just a handful of whoever would come. And they weren't our people that were taking it. Literally, we were running this class, and it was for people outside of Restore. And every part of us could have said, what are we doing? doing like this isn't even for resort church we're not even helping our own people get financially free we're helping a bunch of strangers from god knows where this isn't actually benefiting or or supporting resort church by any stretch of the imagination like you know it's like it's going to be a lot of work and there was a lot it was not convenient right. is what i'm saying yeah. it was not convenient <laughs> at all I mean, on a Sunday afternoon, what a preacher wants to do is go eat and go lie before the Lord for hours, yeah, yeah. not work a nursery and not, you know, stay and, you know, and, um, and the fact is, is it, it was not convenient and it was, it was not, it was not successful on paper, but there was few families that came in and one of those and and they didn't stick around but we were able to love on them and bless them and help them to get their finances in order and one of those families that came in was Miss Velma and Rob and um, and as a result of that the entire clan of them came through and came in and are a huge blessing to restore church and that was totally out of obedience because God said so. Yeah. And I'm not going to tell you that we gathered every Sunday and went, I love doing this. This is awesome. It was Andy, Christy, myself, and Pastor going, what are we doing? This is exhausting. How many more weeks do we have from this? And it was, Andy, can you double up on the lessons? I mean, it was like, no, we really can't, Pastor Jennifer. You know, and it was like, it was one of those things. Don't let the enemy tell you that because you're, because you're in the will of God, it's supposed to be easy and fun. That is so not the case at all. 
In fact, you will probably have more hurdles and higher hurdles because it's the will of God. Amen. Not always. Don't think that you always have to climb the mountain. There are moments of joy God gives you. And I'm um, just kidding. But, but God wants to know, is, is this about obedience? Is this about what I'm having? Do you, are you fighting through feelings? Because this isn't about feelings. It's about faith. It's about understanding that most of the time, it's not about whether you feel it. It's whether you're going to do it. And it's, and it's about the fact that you're not ever going to sometimes feel equipped, but rather it's going to be that you get on your face and understand that I am the one that's equipping you that's right. as you're going. That's right. and, and you don't always wait until you, until you know that you've got this. Most of the time you're going, God, I don't got this and let you give it to me. Yeah. Please, please, please. And that's the perfect place to be. That's right. And so you, you do everything in excellence, and you prepare as much as you possibly can, and you do everything to the utmost of what you know that you're to do, but everything else is left up to God. And you, and you do what you do, but you do it out of obedience. That's right. And that was one of those moments that we sat around the table. We got in the car last week, and we looked at each other, and we said, that, it's just an amazing thing to know that that entire family that is such a blessing to us as we... We're through with our day last Tuesday, and we got in the car, which has had tears in our eyes, and he said, there is nothing I would not do for that family. And I said, and it's so amazing how God brought them to us. Yeah. So amazing. The small things. The small things. You know, even the Bible tells us that we, when we can trust God with the small things, that the bigger and the better and the blessing is right around the corner. Yeah. Luke 16, 10 says, Whoever can be trusted with the very little can also be trusted with the much. And whoever is dishonest with the very little will also be dishonest with the much. You know, I've heard a lot of people say, Man, I'll tithe when I get a bunch of money. No, you won't. If you can't tithe off of five bucks an hour, you won't tithe off of 25 bucks an hour. Can you say amen? God's got to trust you with the small before he's ever willing to trust you with the bigger. Come on, guys. Now watch this. If Peter would not have been obedient with the small things, Peter never would have been a fisher of men catching people for the kingdom. He never would have walked on water. Come on, guys. He never would have performed miracles. He never would have been the leader of the 12, never would have written part of the Bible, and he never would have been willing to trust Jesus and follow his words at the most inconvenient of times. It's the small things that lead to the big blessings. I laugh because conversations that we have with people about I'll tithe when you know writing a $20 check off of off of you know 200 bucks and then writing a, a $200 one off of 2000 faithful with the little amen we're going to wrap this up and ask where are the areas today where you're not being obedient, where I'm not being obedient today? Where are those areas where um, we're just plainly being disobedient? God, I heard you, but I'm just kind of, I'm either pretending that I don't. I got selective hearing right now. Come on, you know what selective hearing is. Two more slides. Obedience is an act of faith. Think about that one real quick. Obedience is an act of faith. Disobedience is the result of unbelief. In other words, if I'm not obeying you, if I'm not going with you, it's because I don't really believe you. Obedience is an act of faith. 
So I want to just ask you, if you're not walking in obedience today, if I'm not walking in obedience today, we need to ask ourselves, are we wrestling with unbelief? Is there something inside of us that says, God, I don't believe you. I, I, I haven't obeyed you yet because I don't believe you. Right. And if that's the case, then you got to go a couple places with that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like one of those diagrams. If that's the case, then follow it here, then this. And if that's the case, then this. Okay, so if I'm not walking in obedience, then I must not believe you. Okay, well, then that's the case. If I don't believe you, God, then maybe, A, I don't know you well enough. Come on. Come on. And I haven't stopped to think of all the times that you have not failed me. So maybe I need to clear my schedule and I need to sit down with you more often, like daily. Come on. Like listen to the sermon last week and remember to put you first and spend some time with you and remember, God how faithful you are so that I can remember your goodness, remember your faithfulness, remember that you are a God that can be trusted and I can get to know you a little bit better because, God, if I don't, if I don't believe you, it's because I don't know you. Come on. That's right. And so the way to fix my unbelief is, A, to know you, and then, B, maybe I just do what Mark 9 and 24 says and I just go to you and say, God, help my unbelief. That's right. Because that's exactly what was prayed in Mark 9 and 24. God, I want to believe you. Help my unbelief. That's right. Because sometimes it's okay to just be human and say, God, I'm just going to be honest. I'm struggling right now. That's right. God, help my unbelief. I'm struggling right now. I want to believe you, but there's just something inside of me. Maybe it's just a set of circumstances from my past, times that I think that you failed or times that I thought you'd come through, but you didn't. God, I'm wrestling with some unbelief from my past or or just unbelief that right now I don't know if you're going to come through because I just don't see how it's possible. God, help my unbelief. Maybe that's where you need to go with this. Because if we're not obeying God somewhere along the way, we don't believe that he's going to come through. And so you got to fix that unbelief or obedience isn't going to happen. And if we're going to sit here in, in disobedience or just plain not obeying, then here's what's going to happen. No blessings are coming your way. Come on. Right. Because we started this entire sermon by saying, if you obey, blessings are coming. If not, they're not. That's right. So as a pastor, I need you to know, you got to fix this mm-hmm. or blessings ain't coming. That's right. That's right. And when blessings aren't coming into your life, I know that human behavior says this. When the blessings stop flowing, you stop coming. Wow. Human behavior says when, when, when the goodies stop coming to Christians... The Christians stop coming to God. We stop. We start doubting, and we start going. Well, you know, I've been showing up for church, and I've been paying my tithe, and I've been, you know, I've been punching the time clock, God, and I've been putting in my thing, and you haven't been bringing it back. So I don't understand. So I'm laying out, and that's human nature, but it's wrong. Right, right. Because God has clearly said this: if you'll obey, the blessings are going to flow. And if we don't, then they won't. So if they're not flowing and we're not obeying, then we got to fix this. we got to fix this. And as your pastors, we got to help you fix this. So here it is. If you're not obeying or you're in disobedience, why? There's unbelief somewhere. Find where the unbelief is. Is it that you don't believe God? Is it that whatever it is that he's asked you to do, you don't believe that you can make it happen, that you can't follow through, that that you don't have what it takes? Because if you look at yourself in the mirror and you go, I don't have what it takes, then you are perfect for the job. Come on. That's right. Right, Cindy? Amen. Right, Andy? Right, Baron Kaylee? Come on. You are perfect for the job. That's right. You're perfect. Right, Christian? He's back there in the booth. There was a time that he, he didn't know what he was doing. Because you don't know until you know. Come on. Come on. Until you get called to it. And God says, you don't know, but you will when I give it to you. That's right. Amen. Where's your unbelief? That's right. The other thing is this. If you have no peace in your life right now, Perhaps it's because you're walking in disobedience to God's will and his ways, and here's why. 
there will be no peace in any soul until that soul is willing to obey God. The voice of God. You're going to say, what verse is that? Well, it's D.L. Moody. Who's he? He's a great man of God. Well, was. Well, is it scriptural? It is. Because everything that we've given you today says, obey me and there's blessings. And see, the thing is, is that when we are not listening to the voice of God, when we are not in obedience to God, we know it. Everything inside of us just knows. Everything inside of us just knows. I'm not comparing us to dogs, but even my dog knows when it doesn't listen. It snake crawls across the ground. I'll walk into the house and when it didn't listen or when it disobeyed and did something wrong, it will snake itself across the ground. It knows. Guys, we know when we're disobedient to our Creator. We know when there's something we should be doing, but we're not. And everything inside of us screams out. There's no peace. You know, some of you are trying to figure out what's wrong with you, why you can't sleep. You're making doctor's appointments. You eat Ambien like it was friggin' candy. It's amazing how much the world will go to extents to try to find out why they're not sleeping, why they're so restless, why they're so anxious, why they're going through this this disease or that, that depression or whatever it is. And the fact of the matter is it really just results in one thing. There's no peace. There's no peace. There's no peace in their life because... They innately know that there's somewhere where they're not in alignment with their creator. And you're going to say, is that always the case? See, we were made and formed and created by a God who he needs to be our first stop. He's also the God who can help us to understand what's going on inside of us. So if, so we're not making this about illness. We're just making this first about peace. So let's just start there. Number one, do you have peace? Is there something inside of you that's not obedient to God, that's running from God, that knows that you should be closer to God or something that he wants from you or something he's been moving on you to do or, or something that he's been asking you to do. It could, be, it could be, hey, I need you to call this person and ask forgiveness or I need you to call this person and receive forgiveness. You know that they know what they did wrong to you and you're letting them sit in that. Someone wronged you. You know they feel bad about it. Call them and let them off the hook. Set them free. But I kind of like having control over them, and that's why. Set them free. When Jesus was on that cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Sometimes you've got to pick up the phone, write a letter, send a text that says, you know what? I just want to let you know you've been on my heart. I've got to set you free with something. I'm not mad at you. I don't know if you know this, but I'm not upset with you. Is there something that God's laid upon your heart? Either you need to let somebody free, either you need to let somebody know that you care about them, you need to make a phone call and let them know that you're with them, that you're for them, that you're not against them. Whatever it is, you pray about it. Is there an act of obedience or is there some way that you're in disobedience that God says that's why you have no peace? Let's pray about that today. Because in all honesty... That wasn't the ending to this message at all. At all. So we're going to let it be so that I can have peace. 
So let's pray. And let's pray about that obedience. Let's pray about our disobedience in any way, shape, or form, whatever that looks like, because the Holy Spirit will tell us what that is. And remember, obedience is an act of faith, and disobedience is just unbelief. So we're going to pray today, and we're going to say, Lord, what is it? Is there an area of my life? Is there something that you're wanting to to call out to me? Is there a way that you want to just tap on my shoulder and say, right there? Right there. Perhaps it's just something that God wants you to do, whether it's to lead a study or or, or, or to just call a, a neighbor over and, and start a little study with them, a, a little group. I, I know that it, we're in the midst of COVID. I get it. Is it a Zoom meeting that, that you can do with a, a group of ladies or a group of people that you can just uh, be a, a, an encourager to them right now? Is there someone on lockdown or, or shut in that you could just encourage them? Is there something that God's been just knocking on your heart to do that you just kind of, kind of just been putting off? I just want you to pray on that because you see, just in the midst of me saying that, you already had something come to your mind. So let's pray. Because it's right now in this season where we're all just where we are that God says it's important. The little things are so important right now. Don't discount them. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. God, thank you, God, that you have brought us a word that says it's so important that you listen to my still small voice. The things that I lay upon your heart, the things that that I bring across your mind that you think are just your thoughts, I'm telling you today they're mine. They keep coming to your mind and, and, and there's someone in need of you, in need of your encouragement, in need of your love, in need of your care, in need of a word that I place upon your heart, whether it's daily or it's weekly whether it's a a word of encouragement right now or it's something that I want you to do repetitively, Father, you have given us moments where we've been asked to obey you. Father, for any time, any instance that we have disobeyed you, Father, forgive us. For moments that we stood in disbelief that either you could use us or that you were even speaking because God it just didn't line up with our schedules or or even what we wanted to do in the moment God forgive us Father thank you that today you reminded us that obedience really is about loving you and worshiping you and following you appreciating you as our God who gave his only begotten son Jesus that you loved us so much that that even in our sin and even in our vile putridness that you still looked upon us and wanted to find a way, the only way, to bridge that gap. And the only way was by the blood of your son, Jesus. Father, for us not to obey you is for us not to appreciate the gift. And so, Father, today we stand and we say, Lord, forgive us. And Lord, we come alongside of you and we love you and we trust you and we support you and we are with you and we follow you and we obey you today. And God, what you've given us to do and the tasks and the and the ministries and the, the heart that you've given us to do things for you upon this earth, God, we will obey you. And when it's not convenient and when it doesn't make sense and when we're doubting ourselves and when we are standing there, God, looking at our schedules, wondering how it will fit, God, we know, Lord, that today when we obey, we're obeying because we love you and because we honor you and we worship you. Father, we thank you today. 
for your word. We thank you even for the moment of rebuke because you love us so much. We thank you, God, that you brought this word today because we want to walk in obedience. We want the blessing that you have for us, God. And we know that there have been so many times that when we've obeyed you, your blessings have flown into our lives. We've watched it happen. We've literally watched us take steps of obedience and we've watched the doors of opportunity fly open so we know, God, that your word is true. And so, God, we thank you today that we will fix our heart on obedience and your promise is for the blessing. Because if you're here today and this message applied to you and you've been wrestling with something that you know you need to surrender and give God total obedience, then let me quickly say these altars are open. We would love the possibility of praying with you, partnering together with you in prayer and in faith, watching God meet that need today. Remember, obedience is all about faith. But also, disobedience can be about fear. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please the Lord. So if you're here today and there's something that you've been wrestling with, maybe a small, tiny task, that we say, man, does it really matter? Sure it does. Remember, it's a small obedience that brings the biggest blessings. So if you're here today and there's something that you need prayer about, we would be honored to pray with you. And I realize there are people here watching today, watching online. We're praying for you as well. God knows what you need, and he wants to meet that need right this moment. So if you're here today, and you would like prayer, let me quickly say these all are we want to pray with you. Bind our faith together with yours. Making it twice as strong and twice as effective. Believing that God's going to touch that need and meet that need. And you will walk in the blessed life. 